Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar.com. This podcast is brought to you by MFS Investment Management, backed by 40 years of essential fixed income. Markets change, but the role fixed income plays shouldn't. That's why we stay true to our traditional approach, essential fixed income. Find out more at mfs.com slash fixed income. This week on the podcast, our earnings roundup with Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Netflix, and IBM. Ed Slot on missed RMDs, what the government shutdown means for the debt ceiling, Russ Kennel on investment themes for 2019, three gold-rated small-cap index funds to consider, and how to build a solid portfolio foundation. Let's get started. First, our analysts' takes on Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Netflix, and IBM. Johnson & Johnson reported fourth quarter earnings that were largely in line with our expectations and we came away with not making any change to our fair value. We continue to believe Johnson & Johnson is worth $130 per share and continues to have a wide economic moat. However, I think there's three important takeaways from the results. First off, the results were in line with our expectations, again, driven by strong drug sales. So these drug sales really offset some of the more slow growth that we see out of the consumer goods and the medical device product group. The second key takeaway here is the guidance for 2019 was a little bit softer than what we were anticipating on the top line, but stronger with other income. And what other income is, is largely divestitures that the company plans to make to help grow the earnings. The net impact of those two things largely doesn't change our fair value. And then the last point that I'd make about the call that they hosted earlier today was that they talked about the telcom powder litigation concerns that have been really over the stock really over the last couple months and they continue to believe in the safety of this product. We continue to believe that this litigation overhang will not cause a significant impact to our fair value. We currently model in close to two billion in litigation concerns result, uh, resolving around the litigation for the telcom powder but again we don't anticipate that to have a material impact on our overall valuation. So the net takeaway from our perspective is the fourth quarter results were largely in line with our expectations expectations. The 2019 outlook is a little softer than we thought, but it doesn't impact our fair value. And we continue to believe the stock is fairly valued. Over the last several years, much focus has resided within P&G's top line trajectory. And the second quarter results highlight that efforts to shed more than 100 brands from its mix and focus its investments behind its key brands are beginning to gain traction. More specifically, organic sales popped 4% in the quarter, similar to the gains reported in the prior quarter and on top of 2% growth in the year ago period. Even more impressive is the fact that this growth was balanced and driven by both gains in price as well as volume. Despite this improving performance that we anticipate will persist over the longer term, the firm is fairly valued at current levels after popping at a mid-single digit clip on the results. We would suggest that investors await a more attractive risk reward opportunity before building a position in this wide moat name. Netflix ended 2018 on a strong note as international subs beat guidance by a handily amount. The company continues to expand both in the U.S. and internationally. But the problem for the company is the cash burn continues with a free cash flow burn of $3 billion in 2018 and a similar level expected in 2019. In our view, Netflix will face increasing competition over the next 18 months as NBC Universal, Warner Media, and Disney all launch services. These services will all contain content from uh, these large media firms, forcing Netflix to increase its content spend on original content. As a result of this increased content spend, we expect cash flow burn to remain at elevated levels over the next five years. This uh, increased content spend will also limit margin expansion both here in the U.S. and internationally. As a result, we continue to believe that Netflix shares are overvalued. Our new fair value estimate is 135. We believe that investors should stay off the roller coaster that is Netflix for the foreseeable future. Overall, our expectations leading into IBM's fourth quarter were anything but stellar. However, the company managed to surprise us with slightly better than expected revenue growth. A couple of bright spots were apparent, with Global Business Services, or GBS, outperforming sales expectations, and the company's systems business managing to decline slower than we had forecast. We think the performance from GBS was particularly notable and supports our opinion that IBM, as well as Accenture, remain the premier global IT services firms. 
We believe IBM's consulting and digital transformation skills are key assets for the firm, and we continue to see mid-term growth tailwinds for this business after prior years of restructuring. The firm provided an inline outlook for fiscal 2019, and while it was a solid end to the year, our fair value estimate remains unchanged at $158 per share. Systems revenue was down significantly, but this was expected due to the highly cyclical nature of this business and the fact that its Z14 mainframe is now at the tail end of its cycle. Analytics and artificial intelligence software help to boost cognitive solutions. And as we look at the next year and beyond, we think IBM's recent $1.8 billion software product sale to HCL will help to lessen IBM's legacy exposure and reinvigorate the subsequent growth profile of the cognitive solutions business. And then finally, technology services and cloud platforms remains mixed, and we think this will be the case for at least the near term, with IBM looking to exit lower value infrastructure work. Overwhelmed by the market? Morningstar Premium will help you cut through the noise and find the most promising investments. Get started today with Morningstar Premium. Next, retirement expert Ed Slot details the steps you need to take if you missed your RMD. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar.com. Despite their best intentions, retirees sometimes miss their required minimum distributions. Joining me to share some steps to take in this situation is Ed Slott. He's a retirement expert. Ed, thank you so much for being here. Great to be back here. Thanks. Ed, let's discuss required minimum distributions um, briefly, which accounts are subject to them and who is subject to them. Well, this is great to start off the year knowing all of your accounts that are subject to RMDs, because we find at tax time, that's when we hear, oh, I missed, I forgot that account, I forgot this account, I took the wrong amount. This is when we see all the errors. In general, IRAs after 70 and a half are subject to required minimum distributions. So are 401ks if you're not still working. If you are still working, there are exceptions for some people. So are any other plan, uh, except Roth IRAs. Roth IRAs, that's the big advantage. They're not subject to lifetime RMDs, but your 403Bs, 457, your 401ks, and your IRAs are subject to RMDs. And especially when people start, that's when the confusion sets in. But every year in the beginning of the year, that's when we hear, oh, I missed it. Right. Um, so let's discuss what happens if you miss it because it's not something you want to mess around with. There's a big penalty, right? Yeah, it's a 50. And I always say 5-0 because it sounds like 15 because right. 50 doesn't sound believable. No. Uh, 50, 5-0% 5 penalty on the amount you should have taken but didn't or any shortfall, let's say. But that penalty can be waived if uh, if you do take the right steps. Okay, so we're going to talk about those steps. Um, if say it's it's the new year and I realized I didn't take my distribution for last year. Um, what process should I go through, first of all, to let the authorities know and also try to make a case about why I missed it? Mm -hmm. that, that Actually, there's some leniency if oh, you're yeah. able to make Okay, Most so let's talk about that. Most people that penalty way. But the first thing you have to know, people always ask, should I go back last year and take it, I said, only if you have a time machine. You can't go back to a year okay. and take and say, I took it that year. So you can't go back. It has nothing to do with the prior year. And some people say, but don't I have unreported income? No. Unreported income is income you took but didn't report. You never took this income. So there's no effect on the prior year other than you have a potential 50% penalty. So you have to make it up Currently, as soon as you discover it, you should figure out the amount you were short or whatever the RMD that was missed and take the makeup distribution immediately. Then, of course, take your regular distribution for the year so you stay on track. And then you report that on what's called Form 5329. 5329, 5329. It's a tax form where you report the 50% penalty. So you tell IRS, this was my required amount, this is how much I didn't take, how much I was short, but you don't pay the penalty. Years ago, you had to pay and then ask for an abatement. Ask for it back. Right. You now don't you have don't. to do okay. that. You just show zero, but you must attach a statement saying two things. Number one, that I made up the shortfall. You have to show good faith that whatever I missed, I took immediately upon discovery. And then give a short explanation of why. And IRS waives the penalty in almost every case. They know they're talking about seniors 
people over 70 and a half. They got confused. They had a medical issue, a death in the family, bad information from a bank, a financial advisor. You just put whatever reason it was and take the mis uh, well, you've already taken the misdistribution right. and file that form with your regular tax return. Okay. So um, there is some leniency, would yes. you say, in terms of getting these penalties waived? Oh, yeah. Almost everybody gets the penalties waived. I can't even think of somebody I have ever seen declined. I've seen one case, and it was an oddball case because they didn't understand the rules, and they actually asked the IRS if they would assess the penalty. It's a long story, but don't ever do that. Okay. So um, in terms of the paper trail that I want to maintain to try to keep my taxes clear and straight, what should I do in terms of um, I'm addressing this missed RMD, but then I also have a, another RMD coming due for this year ahead? How do I handle that? There's no requirement, but what I do on a practical level, I tell people, take separate distributions. Take the makeup distribution separately so it can be better traced if it's ever questioned. There's that one. You could mix it in with your current one, but then somebody would have to figure out, well, did they just take too much of the current one and not the other one? Separate them. Take the mi misdistribution separately and the current one separately so they can be traced. Okay. And then in terms of avoiding this problem altogether, um, do you have any tips on that front of, of things that uh, people who are subject to RMDs can do to avoid falling into this trap? First thing in the beginning of the year, take an inventory of every retirement account you have subject to required minimum distributions. It might be your first year, so you just turned 70 and a half and you didn't know, or maybe you have that old 401k or a 403b. You should have an inventory of all the RMDs, and that includes if you're a beneficiary. Remember, this 50% penalty also applies to beneficiaries. So if you just inherited, you have a, a required minimum distribution, probably starting in the year after you inherited. So you should know all the accounts that are subject to RMDs. But before you take them, uh, going back to something we've talked about in other programs, uh, if you're going to do the qualified charitable distribution, which applies to IRA owners over 70 and a half, do that at the beginning of the year so it can offset the income from your required minimum distribution, because the first dollars out are deemed to satisfy your required minimum distribution. Okay, Ed, useful discussion. I know this problem crops up for some retirees. Yes. Thank, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar.com. Watch all the Morningstar content you love from your living room. Download the Morningstar Roku channel and get up-to-date independent insights on today's markets. Be comfortable. Be informed. Now, Aaron Shapiro on the implications of the government shutdown. As the shutdown stretches into its fourth week, I've been getting a lot of questions about whether anything has changed. I wrote a column earlier in the shutdown explaining that we've got a lot of experience with these, and the longer ones, of course, slightly ding the economy. But the big story is always that shutdowns are a lagging indicator of governmental dysfunction and a leading indicator that it'll be very hard for Congress to accomplish much going forward. Of course, shutdowns have been a regular feature of American government ever since Congress set up the modern appropriations process way back in 1974. So if I can paraphrase Casablanca, this is just like any other shutdown, only more so. The window for this Congress to pass bipartisan legislation that could help ordinary investors was always going to be pretty limited, given the realities of divided government. And these efforts might have included cleaning up the tax bill to fix technical errors, uh, making it easier for 401k savers to access guaranteed income, or adjusting required minimum distributions, just to name a few things Congress is pursuing. And obviously, this shutdown makes doing any of those things a lot more difficult. The shutdown also raises some questions about Congress's ability to deal with something even more important for ordinary investors and the U.S. economy as a whole, the debt ceiling. The media often conflates shutdowns and the debt ceiling, but they're very different, and I want to explain that. The shutdown just means Congress has not appropriated funds to keep federal agencies running. In contrast, failing to raise the debt limit could lead to a financial catastrophe, and that's not my analysis. That's the official line from the U.S. Treasury Department, the U.S. Government Accountability Office, and basically any other expert who's looked at the U.S. defaulting on its obligations. So coming back to the shutdown and investing, after March 1st, the government will need to take what it calls extraordinary measures to avoid defaulting, and those measures will last for a few months. 
Ordinary investors need to be aware that in 2013, the last time it looked as though Congress might not raise the debt limit, the market avoided Treasury securities that matured around the dates when the government projected it would exhaust the extraordinary measures. So looking ahead, uh, ordinary investors shouldn't be surprised if we see an increase in rates and a decline in liquidity if it looks like the debt ceiling fight is going to be dramatic again. The current state of the shutdown, unfortunately, may presage just such drama. In terms of when this shutdown might end, no one knows for sure. But there is an unusual dynamic that is not encouraging. Previous shutdowns have been due to Congress adding riders to appropriations bills that the president deemed unacceptable. The president then had an incentive to make the shutdown hard for ordinary Americans to push for an end to the impasse. Now this shutdown is reversed. The president wants the policy rider. And so he has an incentive to make the shutdown as painless as possible by taking a broad view of what the government can do. Now, for example, the president has tried to keep parks open and has said he will try to send tax refunds back during the shutdown. That may mean things go on for longer than they otherwise would have. From Morningstar, I'm Aaron Shapiro. This podcast is brought to you by MFS Investment Management, backed by 40 years of essential fixed income. Your fixed income strategies should aim to deliver the essentials for your clients. Income, diversification, and risk management. Find out more at mfs.com slash fixed income. Next, Russ Kinnell highlights two areas worthy of more research this year. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar.com. The Turning of the Calendar page provides an opportunity to reassess your portfolio. Joining me to discuss a few investment themes that could be worthy of further research is Russ Kinnell. He's Director of Manager Research for Morningstar. Russ, thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here. Russ, in the most recent issue of Morningstar Fund Investor, you looked at some investment ideas, some themes to investigate in, in 2019. But before we get into that, let's just talk about 2018. It was not a great year for stock or bond investors, right? That's right. Uh, just about everything was in the red. Bonds were about flat, but equities lost between 5 and 20%, depending on what area you invested in. So uh, definitely a, a really volatile year and, and, and certainly could have really altered your portfolio mix. Okay. So you do think that um, as investors are sort of looking at their portfolio, surveying the damage, it's time to take a look at that baseline asset allocation, see where you stand relative to your goals, relative to your spending horizon. Exactly. I, I think the main thing you want to think about is making sure you're, you're still on your plan and making whatever changes are, are needed to get back on that plan. Because obviously when you have uh, some big moves, that can change your portfolio mix. Okay. So one area that you highlighted in the most recent issue of Fund Investor was uh, the small value space. It's an area where even if investors haven't been actively pulling away from it, their positions there have probably shrunk. Let's talk about what's going on with that category. Yeah, small value is an area that just keeps underperforming for a number of years. And usually that's a trend that reverses uh, very nicely. Uh, and you then have a, a, a multi-year rally in small value, or at least outperformance. So uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, potential positives. And you can see some reasons why, if you think about large growth doing well, well, some of the fangs are eating some of those small value companies lunch you know they it's tough to compete with the googles and amazons of the world but not all of the small value companies are uh, in their target area and, and some of that sell off, sell off may be overdone okay so you highlighted a, f a few funds that you like in this space and i'd like to talk about a couple of them one of them i think will probably be familiar to people who have watched you talk about the small value space roy special equity let's talk about what you like about it it's silver-rated, very long-tenured senior manager on the fund. Um, let's talk about what's to, what's to like about it. Oh, yeah, I, I really like Charlie Dreyfus and his approach that really focuses on accounting and, and quality balance sheets. It's, it's a strategy that leads them into uh, Good, good, relatively safe names, and in downturns, it really uh, stands out nicely. If you look at the long-term record of Dreyfus, he's got a he's got a very strong record, and a lot of that is built in losing less in downturns because of that emphasis on accounting. I think it's a little different from anything you see anywhere else. And again, when I look for a fund, I want a competitive advantage, and I think this fund has a genuine competitive advantage. Okay, and it has a co-manager now, so Charlie Dreyfus is not flying this fund solo. He has been on the fund for a number of years, but he has um, he has a, a co-manager. That's right. No retirement date has been announced for Charlie, but obviously uh, 
the, the, the successor is, is there and, and someone, they've, someone who really buys into uh, Dreyfus's way of investing. So we feel pretty good uh, about where the fund is going. Okay. Another uh, small value fund you like, also silver rated, might be a little bit less familiar, LSV small cap value. Let's talk about that one. Right. Fairly different fund. This is a quantitative fund. Uh, LSV is a shop that's very has an academic grounding, lots of PhDs and, and quants uh, running their funds. And so there's a quantitative fund looking for good uh, value names, good companies that are, that are slightly beaten down. Uh, you know, if you look at their long-term record, they've done a very good job across the board at their funds. And, you know, we, we just like that academic grounding and, and the fact that they're always willing to update their models, but at the same time, they don't drastically overhaul. They don't, uh, it doesn't feel like uh, the momentum version of a quant fund. So uh, we think these are really well-designed funds. Okay. Um, another theme that you hit on, um, and this might seem a little uh, perhaps counterintuitive because investors are really moving away from active managers in general. And the ex to the extent that they have active managers, they tend to want the very seasoned ones. But you actually say that uh, rising star managers are people to uh, take a look at, are funds to take a look at. Why is that? Well, yeah, I think uh, if you find a, a manager who's got some experience, but, but not, say, 30 years, you've got someone who may have a very long runway. They may have a lot of years ahead of them of, of doing well. And yet many of these funds are ones that are not that big. So you really kind of have potentially a sweet spot of a, a manager who's really hitting their stride, but is not overwhelmed with assets. And that's really the ideal to, to get to these funds a little ahead of the curve. Uh, so I think it's worth paying attention to these funds, not that I would avoid the seasoned managers. Right. Obviously, I like Charlie Dreyfus, who's got a very long track record. But I think some of these managers are worth investigating, putting on your watch list. OK. So you did uh, compile a more detailed watch list in Fund, Fund Investor, but let's talk about a couple of, of ones that you especially like. Um, one is Vincent Montemagiori at Fidelity Overseas. Let's talk about that one. Uh, yeah, uh, he's, he's a very interesting investor at Fidelity. He's kind of got a Buffett influence, and you see kind of that emphasis on high quality moats, um, a, t a little willingness to pay up. So he fits in the foreign large growth, though there's a lot of large blend uh, names in the portfolio too, but just a very thoughtful investor uh, who really thinks long-term and has built a good record, yet hasn't gotten overwhelmed with assets yet. So uh, we raised it to silver not too long ago, and we really have a high opinion of, of uh, Montemajori. How are you feeling about uh, managerial stability at Fidelity Funds these days? I, have they um, stabilized, would you say, or, or what? Much more so. So yeah. say versus 10 years ago where you had musical chairs, but also right. a lot of people leaving the firm. We really haven't seen that in recent years. It's been uh, much more stability and, and uh, better handling of manager transitions. Uh, so uh, feel a, a lot better about them. I wouldn't yet put them maybe at the top of the list of stability, but mm -hmm. uh, they've improved a lot. Okay. Another fund you'd like also, foreign stock fund. This is uh, T. Rowe Price International Concentrated Equity run by Federico Centilli. Let's talk about that one. Yeah, this is a fund that's got about a four-year record on the retail version, about an eight-year record on the institutional. So we've got a little more to go on than you'd see on the retail version. Uh, but he's built a really good record with a concentrated strategy. Of course, because it's two row, it's only kind of concentrated. Well, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> I don't usually think of them as a concentrated fund right. shop. So this is not like uh, Bill Nigren or Sequoia. They've got 60 names, but the top holding isn't even 3%. So it's not that bold. You're not living or dying on a couple of stocks. But again, uh, a good strategy. Kind of like Monte Majoris in that they're looking for uh, good companies with competitive advantages, uh, trading at a reasonable price, but a little more uh, value tilt. This fund's in the blend category. Um, it's got a big emphasis on Europe in particular. You see overweights to German and Swiss companies. Uh, so a pretty distinctive uh, strategy from, from Tiro. But again, I think this is one that's still under people's radar. Okay, Russ, some interesting themes and some interesting funds. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar.com. Go from one investment analyst to 150. Sign up today for Morningstar Premium and let our independent and unbiased research staff help you find the best investments. Get started today with Morningstar Premium. Now, Adam McCullough on the three highest rated small cap ETFs that Morningstar analysts cover.
Small cap stocks have plenty going for them. They can add diversification to a portfolio and offer greater potential return than large cap stocks, albeit with some additional risk. Here to discuss the three highest rated small cap ETFs that Morningstar analysts cover is Adam McCullough. He's an analyst in our manager research group focusing on passive strategies. Adam, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here today, Susan. Now, all three of the funds that we're going to talk about today track well-constructed investable indexes, and they're inexpensive to boot. But the three funds do have some differences. The first one is Schwab U.S. Small Cap ETF. You're right, Susan. So each of these funds does something a little bit different to dampen the impact of trading costs among the small cap indexes. The first fund is Schwab U.S. Small Cap ETF. So what this fund does, it tracks one of the Dow Jones Small Cap Index and it uses buffering rules so that it doesn't trade stocks unnecessarily on its reconstitution dates. So if a stock graduates to the mid-cap level, it won't trade it into the mid-cap, then out of the mid-cap, then into the mid-cap. If it's on the edge, it'll wait until it's fully in that mid-cap range before trading. So you get the exposure that you want of small cap stocks without unnecessarily trading names as they go between different buckets. And so this fund also charges five basis points per year, so it's cheap. And over the past three years, through December 2018, it's actually outpaced its benchmark by two basis points per year. So that kind of shows, one, that it's mitigating the impact of transaction costs, and two, might have some help with securities leaning income that offsets some of the fees that it charges. Hmm. Now, another one of our gold-rated ETFs is Vanguard Small Cap ETF. How is this one a little bit different? Yeah, so the Vanguard fund is a little bit different in that it tracks uh, the CRISP Small Cap Index. So again, it's looking for small cap stocks, but the CRISP indexes were built to be investable. So maybe the first generation of indexes were more benchmarks, you know, how is your fund performing? The CRISP suite of indexes is made for investment. So what this fund does beyond buffering rules is it actually will spread out trading over five days. So when it makes changes, instead of trading all the stocks on one day, so buying a bunch of names, selling a bunch of names, it trades that over five days in a week. So that'll break the, the impact of the trades by one-fifth because it's trading over, you know, one over five days. And the second thing that it does is it uses a technique called packeting. And so what this means is when a stock graduates to the mid-cap bucket, instead of moving everything at once, once it does get fully into that bucket, it'll move half of the position. So it'll move half the position, wait till the next reconstitution. Mm -hmm. If the stock is still squarely in the mid-cap range, it'll move the other half. So that also breaks the tr trading in half, and so it uh, lowers the market impact costs as well. This fund is rated gold, as you mentioned. Uh, it charges five basis points per year. And over the past three years, through December 2018, it's also topped its benchmark by two basis points. And our last gold-rated um, small cap ETF is iShares Core S&P Small Cap ETF. And this one has a market cap that seems to fall somewhere between the other two funds that we've talked about so far. That's right, yeah. So the iShares Core S&P Small Cap ETF does fall between those other two funds based on uh, its average market cap. But this fund also uses a little different of a technique to avoid um, forecasting its trades in the market. Mm -hmm. And so while the first two funds follow you know, strict reconstitution schedules, the S&P uh, small cap 600 index is actually run by committee. So it doesn't have a pre-scheduled reconstitution mm -hmm. date. And the committee members can actually decide when to add or remove names from the index. Mm -hmm. So you can't forecast out, oh, you know, this is the, the June reconstitution. It looks like these stocks might graduate to the mid-cap index and will be sold out of this index. So they can say, you know what, now it's time to reconstitute. We're going to go ahead and do that. And so by not forecasting the trades, it lowers the transaction costs for funds such as this fund that track the index. And this fund is also cheap, charges seven basis points per year. Um, it's actually uh, not outpaced its index, unlike the other two funds. It's lagged by one basis point over three years, but still very small. Yeah. These all sound like great options for investors. Adam, thank you for your insights today. Absolutely. I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar.com. Thank you for watching. Can your portfolio weather the market? Use our premium portfolio tools to identify risks and streamline your holdings. Get started today with Morningstar Premium. And finally, Alex Bryan on building a strong foundation with core funds. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar.com. How can investors build a solid foundation for their portfolios? Joining me via Skype to discuss that topic is Alex Bryan. He's Director of Passive Research Strategies for Morningstar in North America. Alex, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. 
You dedicated the most recent issue of Morningstar ETF Investor to the topic of building a strong foundation for investors' portfolios, and you emphasize the importance of asset allocation, deciding what is an appropriate stock, bond, cash mix for you given your life stage. You say that investors uh, spend a lot more time on security selection, but ultimately asset allocation is more impactful. How do you know that? What does the research say about that topic? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, imagine you had a, um, a portfolio that was allocated 40% to U.S. stocks, 20% to uh, international stocks, and 40% to bonds. Uh, if you had perfect foresight and could somehow identify the managers that would have gone on to uh, land in the top 5% of their respective Morningstar categories in each of those areas, um, you would have had a return of about 7.6% over the last 15 years through November. Now, if you had instead decided to build that allocation with broad market cap weighted indexes, your return would have been about 6.8%. So um, that type of, uh, achieving that type of success with manager selection is very difficult. And as you can see from that example, the um, return benefit is relatively modest. But if I had instead decided to shift the asset allocation from 60% in stocks to 90% in stocks, the return of the portfolio would have climbed from 6.8% to uh, 8%. So uh, shifting the asset allocation has a much bigger impact on your overall portfolio's risk and its returns. And that, that makes sense because um, you know stocks and bonds perform quite differently. So how much you decide to allocate to each bucket is going to have a much bigger impact on your overall uh, performance than manager selection within each of those categories. I know that's one thing that investors really struggle with, this idea of finding an appropriate asset allocation. I hear from a lot of investors that it seems quite black boxy to them. Do you have any thoughts on what factors investors should home in on when they're trying to think about setting their asset allocation? What should they prioritize? Well, I think uh, while we, we talk a lot about returns, and that certainly draws um, our attention, I think, more than anything else, it's really important to allow your your ability and um, willingness to take risks really dictate what type of asset allocation you have. And it's important not to take more risk than you're comfortable with, because if you do that, uh, you might experience losses that you're not pre uh, prepared to handle, and it can make it more difficult to stay invested through the market's rough patches, will, which will inevitably happen over time. And how do investors take their own personal situations and customize that to arrive at some sort of an appropriate asset allocation plan? So I think one of the, the first things you should do uh, to figure out how much risk you should take is uh, identify the time period um, for which you have for your investment. So if I don't need the money for a long period of time, I can afford to take greater risk with my money because uh, the risk of losing money actually goes down the longer your investment horizon is. So uh, stocks have um, you know, a, a better shot of um, earning a positive return the longer that you hold them. Um, so if I have uh, a really big um, objective that I need to meet, let's say I'm making a down payment on the house uh, in the next year or so, I probably shouldn't allocate a lot of my money to stocks because there's a good shot I can I could lose money um, you know, over a short window of time. But the longer uh, your investment horizon, the more risk you can take. Um, so it's important to, um, to keep that in mind. It's also important to understand your own willingness to take risk. Uh, if you're not comfortable with the prospect of losing money, uh, it's probably not a good idea to allocate a big part of your portfolio to stocks. You need to have a balanced allocation that lets you sleep at night and something that you can stick with over the long term. Assuming someone has taken those steps and identified a pro an appropriate asset allocation mix, the next step is to populate that portfolio with some good core building blocks. Are there any uh, categories that you would suggest investors focus on, any investment types that you would suggest that they tend to favor at the expense of others? Well, the most important thing to keep in mind for uh, identifying core investments, these are funds that uh, should be broadly diversified, uh, that should be very low cost, and they should be holdings that you can stick with regardless of what's happening in the market. So uh, the types of Morningstar categories that you might look for a core holding in would be the Morningstar uh, large blend category. This is typically going to be your, uh, your broadest bucket of, um, of stocks. It includes large cap stocks across the value growth style spectrum. Uh, you'd also want to look for your, um, 
exposure to international stocks within the Morningstar foreign large blend category. And then as far as bonds go, uh, it's good to look within the uh, intermediate term bond category, which focuses on U.S. investment grade bonds. Um, so typically within each of those categories, I would want to look for funds that are broadly diversified and funds that are uh, among the lowest cost options within each of those categories, because uh, over time, these are one of the best predictors of fund performance. The less you pay, the better your odds are of achieving better returns. What you've just talked about, I think, naturally would lead investors to favor perhaps some uh, core type passively managed funds. Can you talk about some of your favorite funds within each of those categories? Sure. So I think, um, as you mentioned, these broad um, index funds are a good starting point. Uh, it's certainly not the only type of fund that would be suitable as a core holding. But I think if you're looking for a good place to start, uh, the one of the better options is the Vanguard Total a stock market ETF, the ticker is VTI. This fund basically owns all U.S. stocks and then it weights them based on their relative market capitalization. So effectively what this is doing is it's owning the market portfolio, harnessing all investors' collective wisdom, and it's delivering that exposure at a very, very low fee. Um, and that low fee allows investors to, um, you know, uh, keep more of their money. So this fund has a good shot of outperforming relative to its actively managed peers because it charges um, considerably less. It's also a very tax efficient option. It's low turnover. Um, it hasn't made any capital gains uh, distributions over its life. So I think this is a really good core option for exposure to U.S. stocks. If you're looking for exposure to international stocks, um, the Vanguard uh, Total International Stock ETF, uh, ticker VXUS, is a really great option. It, uh, again, owns most uh, stocks listed outside the U.S., both foreign developed and emerging market stocks, and then weights them according to their market capitalization. This is also a very low cost uh, fund that has been very tax efficient. So I think it's a good complement to uh, that U.S. Uh, stock fund. And then as for uh, fixed income exposure, uh, Vanguard Total Bond Market ETF, ticker BND is a really good option. This fund basically provides broad exposure to the U.S. investment grade bond market. Um, so it owns treasuries, corporate bonds, mortgage-backed securities, um, and it weights each of those bonds according to its market value. So it does tend to tilt pretty heavily toward pretty conservative U.S. treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. Um, but that actually makes this a pretty good complement to stocks because um, those more highly rated conservative bonds tend to provide good downside protection. So in periods when the stock market is selling off, uh, this can provide a, a nice counterbalance to stocks um, and, and serve as the defense within your portfolio. So I think between these three funds, the uh, um, Vanguard Total Stock Market Fund for U.S. stocks, the Vanguard uh, Total International uh, Fund, and the Vanguard Total Bond Market ETF, uh, I think these can help you build a really solid core portfolio that you can stick with through thick and thin. Great recommendations, Alex. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar.com. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar.com. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.